Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. We're going to need our Heavenly Father's guidance as we delve into this study, as we delve into the studies from these books that we have covered before, because we're going to have to understand these even more clearly than we did several months ago. So shall we ask for his blessing as we now approach his throne and as we open his word to understand the admonitions that he is giving to us for today? Will you now join me in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for these hours where we may come together and study. Father, we know that we have sinned. We are amazed at the links that you are going to help us to be able to stand before you. There's truly nothing we can do without you. Father, as we come before you on this Sabbath, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your guidance and we ask for your wisdom. Help us today to get help us to discuss these subjects we ask that your will is done we ask that your character is revealed in how we treat each other and how we approach this study be with us now may your angels attend us may your spirit guide us We accept and we claim that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. Join with us now. Show us this, Father, that we so sorely need for this time. Hide me behind your cross. May it be your words and your character that others see. Be with us now. For this we thank you, and for this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. To recap briefly this lap from this last week, we have been working through and studying the book of Zechariah. There are several admonitions that Mrs. White had given that we need to be aware of. <clears throat> We're going to recover just a little bit from what we addressed last week, but we are going to address very specifically items that are going to be necessary for our consideration. Now I'd ask Brother Theodore to send out copies of these studies to all so that you would have them in advance because there's quite a bit to cover. As Sister White had written on 10th of October of 1897, I arose at 3 a.m. I am asking my Heavenly Father for a larger portion of his Holy Spirit. Without me, said Christ, you can do nothing. Now, are we all familiar with this verse? Are we all familiar with this admonition? Is there a problem with my question? Mm -hmm. I don't understand the question. What, what admonition? 
without me, you can do nothing. Okay. Are we familiar with this? Oh, yeah. I just don't think of it as an admonition. So, Well, let's, let's look at it in this way. How many today believe that they are doing for Christ without accepting of Christ when they're trying to do things in their own power? Hmm. Well, you know, that can be a little bit deceptive uh, because people may not really understand they're doing things in their own power. Um, but Jesus is telling us, you know, plainly that without him, that we can do nothing. Correct. I mean, that should be well understood intellectually. It needs to be understood intellectually. If we move forward in any service without the earnest seeking of wisdom from God, we shall make failures. But if we keep the mind stayed upon Christ, who is our efficiency, we will be strong in his strength and the power of his might. Zechariah 3 and Zechariah 4 need to be carefully studied. For there is much in these chapters that is essential for us in these days. That we may have a strength that is not our own. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4, 6. This is a lesson all have to learn who have any connection with the sacred work of God. Satan will furnish an abundance of speculative projects that are not after God's order, but are inspired by man's ambitious devising. Thousands of dollars may be spent in traveling. In this way, money is consumed, but it accomplishes little. The only right way is to stop devising wonderful plans that absorb means and create inventions that God does not inspire and that devote the Lord's means and your God-given faculties to setting in operation a work that will reach the neglected ones, the oppressed, those that cannot rise of themselves. Dr. Kellogg is doing a work which, if the churches shall be converted, they can undertake in a limited degree. It gives opportunity for many to minister for God. There are families within the shadow of your own doors in whom you have not shown sufficient interest to lead them to think that you cared for their souls. I entreat of you to read the third and the fourth chapters of Zechariah. If these chapters are understood, if they are received, a work will be done for those that, which are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, a work that will be an advance work, a work that means go forward and go upward. Here are the requirements of God to his people. The Ten Commandments express the will of God and the duty of all men. And when the hearts of men are thoroughly converted, they are brought into perfect harmony with the attributes of God, for this is always the effect of divine grace. In this harmony with God is spiritual life and efficiency and power. There is to be no divorcing of the interest of those who believe sacred truths to take up and confederate with men of the world or men of the church whom the world has converted to their worldly methods and plans. <clears throat> when men who have the light of truth and do not walk in that light but follow the sparks of the fire of their own kindling they shall lie down in sorrow God will have his people to look to him and derive their strength and power from him and not trust those who are, obe who are not obedient to his commandments it is the will of God that men should be set apart to minister in sacred service in various lines for him 
to preach the word of God, as did John, preparing the way of the Lord. There must be no binding up in confederacies with men. Bind up in covenant relation with God. Is there a question regarding this statement? Or do we all understand this and understand it clearly? <clears throat> well, I understand it. Now, one of the points that I found as I prepared for these meetings is Mrs. White was very clear <clears throat> in admonition that we should be studying Zechariah 4 with Haggai 1. Now, we're going to switch screens for just a moment. We studied Haggai chapter 1 several months ago. <laughs> Here, we have Haggai reproving the people's delay in building the temple. He incites them to set about it. He promises them, being forward of themselves, God's assistance, and the work is set forward. Now, from the work that Brother Stephen had done, when was the book of Haggai being presented before the people? And when was the book of Zechariah being presented before the people? Well, this is 520 and 519 BC. So Haggai is in 520 BC. Okay. And Zechariah would have been when? Well, 520 and 519. Uh, I think maybe even into 518, his last vision. <clears throat> So it's, it is possible that Zechariah and Haggai knew each other. Or knew of each other, right? Yeah, that's definitely possible, especially since, um, you know, they're giving a message to God's people regarding uh, rebuilding the temple. You know. Now, was this the temple that was being built under the third decree? Uh, well, there's no temple built under the third decree. The temple's built under the first and second decrees. Okay. So if this is the temple that's being built under the first and the second decree, is this also, in a manner of speaking, being built under the first and the second angel's messages? Mm -hmm. Would you all agree with that? Because yeah. when you look, yeah, because when you look at Millerite history, um, and we talk about like the laying of the foundation, and I know we had a bit of this discussion exactly how did Jeff come up with the idea of the foundation being laid, and Stephen suggested that that was from the study of uh, the the decrees. Though I'm not certain that that was the case because I think they understood the foundation simply as the context of the charts being the foundation. Um, but later, when we, uh, when the movement was studying uh, the three decrees, then we saw that there was a literal sense in which the foundation was being laid under the first angel's message, right? Because the foundation is laid under the first decree. And then the temple is completed under the second decree. Right. And then, you know, in Millerite history, you have Christ moved from the holy to the most holy place. So the temple foundation, the temple that's being built there in Millerite history is God's people in that history. Right. So in our history, again, you know, this this temple being built has to do with his church. But literally here in this history, it's it's the actual temple. Are we being given an admonition to rebuild the temple? Mm -hmm. 
what temple are we to see built? Well, this, well, this is God's church. Um, you know, there's a, there's a few statements in Ellen White's writings uh, regarding, because we know that where it talks about um, in the book of Hebrews, uh, the true tabernacle, which the Lord built and not man, right? right. We know it was a heavenly sanctuary. But also Ellen White applies uh, that true tabernacle to God's church. She a statement something like north, east, west, and south, um, and encompassing the whole world is the true tabernacle which the Lord built and not man. I can find the statement if you want. The first place I read this was in um, M. L. Andreessen's book on, I believe it was the one either sanctuary, one in the sanctuary, or the one on the book of Hebrews. Uh, because that was a long time ago that I saw that, about 40 years ago. But um, um, but I've always kept that in mind because, you know, we often just refer, well, to the heavenly sanctuary. But there's a connection between this, the heavenly sanctuary, what God's doing in heaven, and what's happening on earth. I'll, I'll find this statement here. But uh, so the temple is... You know, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is not just about the heavenly sanctuary. It's about um, uh, God's church. Let me see here. I got the right wording. Yeah, the church on earth. So this is from Signs of the Times, 1874. Um, right. Or no, pardon. Uh, actually, pardon me. It's February 14th, 1900. February 14th, 1900. The church on earth, composed of those who are faithful and loyal to God, is the true tabernacle. And there she puts that in quotation marks. Um, so she's quoting Hebrews. Whereof the Lord is the minister and not man, pitched with, uh, with it, uh, whereof the Redeemer is the minister. God and not man pitched this tabernacle on a high elevated platform. That this tabernacle is Christ's body. And from north, south, east, and west, he gathers those who shall compose it. Um, so the church on earth is that temple that needs to be built. And so we are involved in uh, that work of building this temple. Does Peter not speak <clears throat> of a temple built with living stones? Mm -hmm. Now, In the time where Haggai and Zechariah prophesied, a temple was to be completed under the decrees, the first and the second decrees, for this to go forward. If we make the application <clears throat> that these decrees parallel the first and the second angel's messages, then for our time, <clears throat> as the temple that is built with living stones, built without hands, is to be constructed, that this being the true tabernacle are we now not to cooperate with God so that his tabernacle of living stones may be completed now she wrote here 
I am burdened with a message that God has given me to bear to you. You are to cease from putting your trust in man. Many of you have been led and influenced by men in positions of responsibility who were not obeying the word of God, but brought into their business dealing principles that God never sanctioned and will never sanction. The question has been asked, what do you mean by a confederacy? Who have formed confederacies? You know what a confederacy is. A union of men in a work that does not bear the stamp of pure, straightforward, unswerving integrity. Please read the first chapter of Haggai. The dearth of means in the treasury is the sure result of work that God cannot sanction. Men have tried to rob their brethren of their rights and have selfishly grasped all the available means to turn to the advantage of the Review and Herald office. They have tried to justify themselves by saying, I am doing it for the cause of God. Human preferences and prejudices have swayed minds of those who have confederated to sustain methods contrary to the word of God. Selfishness has led those who ought to be true to principle to make crooked paths for their feet. Thus saith the Lord, all day long I have stretched forth my hands into a, a disobedient and gainsaying people, Romans 10.21. A moral earthquake is needed to arouse men and women from their spiritual slumbers and bring them to a realization of the situation. <clears throat> there are those <clears throat> whose hearts should be filled with remorse, who should cry to God to have mercy upon them. Unless we obey God at whatever cost, unless we walk in his way, overcoming all selfishness, we are not truly converted. A profession of faith alone will not save any soul. The profession must be accompanied by practical Christian work. Now, it's been interesting to me in putting together so many of the Spirit of Prophecy statements that so many of these statements are from documents that had not been published in entirety before 2015. The very angels who, when Satan was seeking the supremacy, fought the battle in the heavenly courts and triumphed on the side of God, the very angels who, from their exalted position, shouted for joy over the creation of our world and over the creation of of our first parents who were to inhabit the earth, the angels who witnessed the fall of man and his expulsion from his Eden home are most intensely interested to work in union with the fallen redeemed race in the development of the power which God gives to help every man who will unite with heavenly intelligences to seek and save human beings who are perishing in their sins. If men will become partakers of the divine nature and separate selfishness from their lives, special talents for helping one another will be granted them. Now that's an interesting promise. If all will love as Christ has loved, that perishing men may be saved from ruin, Oh, what a change will come to our world. So what are we to then see separated from our lives? Is she clear about this point? Mm -hmm. Here, she repeats Zephaniah 3, verses 12 to 17. Here, 
We have studied this in the past. What a representation is this? Can we grasp its meaning? Do we understand what we studied before from Zephaniah 3? Here the promise is made. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. <clears throat> In the book of Ezekiel, who are the ones that are given a message to come before the ancient ones in Jerusalem? Is it not those that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in Jerusalem? Are they not the same as those that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly? Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and I will gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. <clears throat> at that time I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth, when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord, Zechariah 3, verses 18 to 20. Again, she states, read also the first chapter of Haggai. It is fitting that all who realize the near coming of the Lord will act their faith. When we see one of God's instrumentalities languishing or in peril, let those who are heart and soul in the work manifest their interest. If we would be one in mind and heart with the heavenly intelligences, we can be worked by them. When human agencies as stewards of God will unitedly take of the Lord's own substance and use it to lift the burdens resting upon his institutions. The Lord will cooperate with them. This manuscript, Manuscript 65 of 1900, can also be found in pamphlet 008 from paragraphs 9 to 11. Does that symbol mean anything to us today? Twenty zero one September. Okay. Then are we, from what she is pointing out here, are we to be in covenant relationship with those of the world? Does a steward of God seek to be in covenant with the world? No, he does not. If a steward of God is in covenant with the world, is he lifting the burdens from the institutions or from his brothers and sisters? Now, from Six Testimonies, page 457. 
Is there not something stimulating and inspiring in this thought that the human agent stands as the visible instrument to confer the blessing of angelic agencies? How many times have I heard it asked that if this message is correct, why are we not then seeing the miracles of God performed? <clears throat> Yet many times we are standing before others, being the visible representation for God and for his message. Seeking to give a message to a world that is soon to end. Are we thus laborers together with God? As we are thus laborers together with God, the work will bear the inscription of the divine. The knowledge and the activity of the heavenly workers united with the knowledge and power that are imparted to human agencies bring relief to the oppressed and the distressed. Our acts of unselfish ministry make us partakers in the success that results from the relief offered. With what joy heaven looks upon those blended influences. All heaven is watching those agencies that are as the hand to work out the purpose of God in the earth thus doing the will of God in heaven. Such cooperation accomplishes a work that brings honor and glory and majesty to God. Oh, if all would love as Christ has loved, that perishing men might be saved from ruin, what a change would come to this world. Here again, Mrs. White quotes, Zephaniah 3, 12 to 17. Again, she gives the question, just as she did before. What a representation is this? Can we grasp its meaning? And her quote was of this. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and a poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. They shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Do we fully understand what's being represented here? Do we fully understand this promise? When human agencies as stewards of God will unitedly take of the Lord's own substance and use it to lift the burdens resting on his institutions, the Lord will cooperate with them. Now, here, six testimonies, 458. Point three, she joins with the passages from Zechariah with the prophecy of Zephaniah. Here she repeats Zechariah 4 in total. What she says directly after this in six testimonies 459. All heaven takes an interest not only in the lands that are nigh and need our help, but in the lands that are afar off. The heavenly beings are watching and waiting for human agencies to be deeply moved by the needs of their fellow workmen who are in perplexity and trial 
in sorrow and in distress. In all ways, the Lord is watching what is going on. Are we willing to do the work where he is leading us? Or are we going to criticize brothers and sisters for not doing things exactly as we think should be done? When one of the Lord's institutions falls into decay, the more prosperous institutions should work to the utmost of their ability in assisting the crippled institution that the name of God not be dishonored. Whenever the managers of God's institutions close their hearts to the necessities of sister institutions and neglect to make every possible effort for their relief, selfishly saying, let them suffer, God marks their cruelty, and the time will come when they will have to pass through a similar experience of humiliation. But my brethren, you, don't, you do not mean to do this. I know that you do not. Now, from here, in the book of Haggai, we begin with the command to rebuild the temple. And this is, this command is being given in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. Now, have we, have we directly come to an understanding of when this command was being given? From the work that Brother Stephen did, do we have this, do we have this understanding at hand for all of us? Or do any have questions about when this, when this was to occur? Well, it's actually my work, not Stephen's work, but <laughs> so um, so the command to rebuild the temple is going to happen in the sixth year of Darius. Right. right. Second year of Darius okay. in the sixth month. No, this is not the command. Right. This is, this is just the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. Begins okay. in, nice. So that's going to be in 520 BC. Okay. So, so Haggai and Zechariah begin prophesying at that time. But the decree of Darius, Ellen White says, that between Cyrus's decree, which we know happens uh, April 23rd, um, 537 BC, that's the 24th day of the first month. Between uh, Cyrus's and Darius's decree, it's more than 20 years. And then it's going to be less than 20 years from when uh, the Jews return to Jerusalem under Cyrus's decree. And then they're going to set up the altar on the first day of the seventh month. So if we take that, that means the decree of Darius happened in 516 BC, BC, sometime between April and um, September. So, so we have Ellen White's very specific in that in that that's when Darius's decree occurred. So the decree is in 516. So it's not it's in the sixth year of Darius that you're going to have the decree self does that make sense okay uh, you lost me theodore okay so ellen white tells us between cyrus's and darius's decree is more than 20 years right so um we know that um uh in 536 I, did i say 537 so in 536 in april 23rd 536 is cyrus's decree 
And so it's going to be more than 20 years from Cyrus's decree to Darius's decree. So that means Darius's decree happens sometime after April in, you know, 516. But we know it's also less than 20 years between um, when the Jews return to Jerusalem. Ellen White says it's less than 20 years from when they ter- return to Jerusalem and Darius's decree. So that means it's the decree happen, has to happen somewhere between the end of April in 516 to September. So that means it would be in the summer of 516 BC, Darius's decree. So that's in the sixth year of Darius, not in the second year. So here it's just talking about Haggai prophesying. It's not talking about the decree. Okay. Okay. I got it now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're dealing with, uh, as this is in Haggai, first day of the sixth month of 520 BC, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So we would we would count this basically as the 29th of August. And roughly four years later, we would be seeing this decree going forth, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, the reason that I'm calling this out is that we may see a similar time period in our studies that we're going to go back into tomorrow in the book of Esther. So we're given this prophecy on the first day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius, which we would count as 520 BC, using Mm -hmm. the Julian calendar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be August, yeah, August 29th, as you said, 520 BC calendar. So this was a temple that was being built of stone and being built with the hands of man, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to keep this in mind as we are looking at both the books of Zechariah and the book here of Haggai. Because we're not only looking at the same time period, we're looking at many of the same people. I just want to share the chart that I have here of okay. Haggai. Go ahead. Uh, so here's the chart of the books of Haggai and Zechariah and their their visions that are dated. So you can see here, you, Darius's reign begins September 29th, 522 BC. That's the 10th day of the seventh month that his reign begins. Okay. And and then you have Haggai, all of his prophesying is in 520. So he has four different dates uh, that are given. You can see them there. The six, first day of the sixth month, the 24th day of the sixth month, the 21st day of the seventh month, and the 24th day of the ninth month. And then you can see that Zechariah begins prophesying just when Haggai is finishing. So Zechariah is going to prophesy in the eighth month in the second year of Darius. We don't know when in the eighth month, because it doesn't give us a date in Zechariah 1.1. Could be the first day of the eighth month. Often that's what they'll do is they just say the eighth month and that means the first day, but doesn't specify it. And then he's gonna have um, two more dated visions 
uh, one in Zechariah 1, 7, and one in Zechariah 7, 1. So those, those dates there. Um, and, the, and the second one's going to be in the fourth year. But we put Darius's decree uh, in 516, so somewhere in the summer there. And then the temple's going to be completed about seven months later. It's going to be dedicated in technically in 515 BC, but still in the sixth year of Darius, because the sixth year of Darius, it's going to be the 12th month, the third day of the month. It's going to be March 12th, 515. So, so hopefully that helps the diagram there. Yeah, it it's helps. Totally, yeah. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, it helps. No, that's good. Okay, Dwight. Okay. The Lord is the shield of his people. He alone must be our strength, our sufficiency. He says to his people, fear not. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Psalm 46, 5. Our relationship with God must be of a distinct character as a people waiting and watching for the Son of Man to come in the clouds of heaven. The church whom God loves and keeps as his commandment-keeping people is as precious as the apple of his eye. The Lord saith, do you know your privileges? Have you faith in God? Have you a living connection with God? Do we sense his love as light in the morning in the midst of the church militant, feeding each lamp with the golden oil of his grace, of his love? Here, she looks to Zechariah 4 and Deuteronomy 10, 19 to 22. Now, at this point, have we seen the fruits of the church triumphant? Well, no. she is, yep, exactly. <clears throat> she is she is saying to us that we are yet among the church militant because many are choosing not to accept the golden oil of God's grace. The next document that we're going to be looking at briefly was written on the sixth day of the seventh month of the biblical year of 5942, which was the 3rd of October of 1897. Now, is there anything special about the sixth day of the seventh month? What was occurring then in a biblical year? Well, that's the, the period between uh, Rosh Hashanah and uh, the Day of Atonement. So we're talking about the Feast of Trumpets. Mm -hmm. Is this not a warning then for us that judgment is about to come? We must consider this carefully. My attention has been called to the last books of the Old Testament. I was directed to bid the people of God take heed how they hear and what they do. These scriptures make special reference to the last days when Bible history will be unfolded. They are brought to our notice those who are not walking in the way of the Lord, but are following deceptive leadings. 
from the word, we are to learn the will of God for the guidance of our own course of action in these last days. Let your minds take in the subject. Read and consider and be instructed. Now, last night, it was being brought out very clearly that there have been many that have chosen to follow deceptive leadings. There are many that view the message of righteousness by faith in an incorrect manner. Because there have been so many that have chosen to present similar messages that are not of God, that have been of man. If you were not able to attend last night's meeting, I recommend to each that you take the time, observe what went on in this meeting, consider carefully many of the things that were being said. From the destruction of the first temple, which the Lord could not bless because the people had corrupted their ways until the second was built, there was a space of 70 years. Is a span of 70 years important for us to consider? Very much. I've been studying this quite a bit over the last several months. Though some murmured over the inferiority of the second temple, the Lord declared it to be superior because it was to be connected in a special way with the Messiah. I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Be strong, saith the Lord, for I am with you. Haggai 2.4 Now it's interesting to me when we look at this passage from Genesis 49 that we actually have two symbols being presented within this verse. Not only is a scepter not to depart from Judah. And what is a scepter? Kingship. It's a what? Kingship. Kingship. And a lawgiver. Right. And yet we also have Genesis 49 and we have verse 10. 49 being the symbol of seven by seven. And we have 10 being the symbol of the number of judgment. Yet we are told. Be strong, saith the Lord, for I am with you. Do we not greatly appreciate this promise that we should be strong because the Lord is with us? Yes, we should very much appreciate. Exactly. It is dishonoring for God for our churches to be burdened with debt. This state of things need not exist. It shows wrong management from beginning to end, and it is a dishonor to the God of heaven. 
read and study prayerfully the fourth chapter of Zechariah. Then read the first chapter of Haggai and see if this representation does not apply to you. While you have thought much of your own selves, of your own selfish interests, you have either neglected to arise and build, or you have built on hired money and have not made donations to free the church buildings from debt. Will you consider what it is your duty to do? Year after year passes by, and very little sacrifice is made to lessen this debt. The interest swallows up the means that should be used to pay off the principal. This is not just an admonition about money. This is also an admonition to us about our responsibility regarding the lives of others. In Manuscript 20 of 1899, another non-published manuscript, the parable of the talents represents a most important truth which all should understand. God has not distributed his talents capriciously. He's not decided a little bit here, a little bit there. He's had a reason for all of the talents that he has provided to us. To every man and woman are given abilities which will fit them for the work that God calls them to do. There is to be no sleeping at the post of duty. Every soul is to understand that he has a work to do for God. Now, is this every soul in the church? I is hope so. It, huh? Yeah, I hope so. Every soul in the church. I look at it that God has given this to understand that every soul, either in or out of the church, has a work to do for God. Study carefully the fourth chapter of Zechariah and learn what the two olive trees there referred to mean. Read it carefully verse by verse, for in this chapter the features of the work in which we are engaged, are plainly set forth. All of this is to give us the foundation of why we're going to see so much in this fourth chapter of Zechariah. Why it is combined, according to Mrs. White, with the first chapter of Haggai. These documents that Brother Theodore sent out, that I asked him to send out, was led to ask to be sent out, are being done so that we have the opportunity to read them over before we are studying them, so we can have a conversation about what this means to us today. Again, manuscript 192-1901, roughly two years later. Again, a non-published manuscript. There are things I must copy from the letters written. John gives the description of the personal presence of Jesus Christ. When we have the personal presence of Jesus before us, we will see an act as John did in Revelation 1, verses 17 to 20. When we have this personal presence of Jesus Christ, what vision are we having? 
Are we having the calzone vision? No. Are we having the Marah vision? The vision which is true. The vision mm -hmm. of the 2300. No. Are we having the Mare vision, the vision of the looking glass? Mm -hmm. John saw it this way. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not. How many other times in Scripture can we point to Christ telling someone, Fear not? This is not just an angel in Revelation 1. This is not just another prophet. This is Christ himself. Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen. And the things which are. And the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. And the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The churches are represented by golden lamps. They hold the treasure of the oil, and they disperse the light. Are we today to be that treasure of the oil? A lamp in itself is not light. It is the instrument, the vessel, from which light is to be dispensed, dispersed, given out to others. Are we to hold on to this light for our own benefit only. No, we are not. As she continues, it must receive both oil and fire before it can shine forth. Brothers and sisters, we have been receiving oil through the ministry of Elder Jeff, through the studies that we have been doing these last several years, and we are waiting for the fire to shine. A church of itself has not graced the fire of God's love or his glory. All is wholly dependent upon Christ, the source of all light, Receiving from Christ the golden treasure of oil and the fire, it can shine forth in distinct rays amid the moral darkness. The Lord's messengers have a message to bear, which is the golden oil of sacred truth. And if these messengers first receive the oil as it is represented in Zechariah 4, they will present the truth with all fervency to make it appear in its importance. There are those today that would seek to say that these studies that have involved chronology, that have involved numbers, that have involved prophecy are of no value that all we need to do is speak of the love of Christ. But we need to know in whom we have faith. We need to be able to disperse the light that God is giving us. This is why these studies have been so important.
The explanation is given. And the angel said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which re upon the top, that which are upon the top thereof, and the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We are also told to read verses 7 to 9. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Verse 10. Read also verse 11. And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches which through the golden pipes carry the golden oil out of themselves? Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. My brethren who have had, who have the truth for these last days, bear in mind the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Whether the times be favorable or adverse, whether there is an opportunity, press in. And when there is no opening, use every means possible to make one. Present the truth. The judge standeth before the door. Sinners are all around you. Speak to them the word of God. Lose not a chance, miss no opportunity to let the light of heaven shine through the human instrument. If the opportunity does not come to you, make your opportunity. Every soul is precious. Does this not show that God wants none to perish? but would prefer that all are saved. We need to do the work that he sets before us. We need not just that oil, but we also need the fire from on high, not the fire of our own kindling. We are now intensely in earnest, and I have a message from the Lord. It is a mistake to have a few men to devise and to plan for a whole conference. The voice said, divide and subdivide, for the work of God shall require that men shall be selected as caretakers, ordained to do the work of God. The end is near, and every year Satan is drilling his army to develop strong parties to be ready against the great battle of the last conflict. Habakkuk chapter 2. This is a faint description of reality. Who is wise in the time when the evil shall spring forth? Here we're shown the book of Zephaniah and then Zechariah 3 and 4. All these things shall become a living reality. But men in high places, supposing themselves wise, will block the way. A voice was heard, clear the king's highway. Now, if Habakkuk 2, Zephaniah, the entire book, and Zechariah 3 and 4 shall become a living reality, what should that mean for us?
are these not symbols that will become literal? Can we make that kind of an application? Or am I being too far afield? What do you say? What are your thoughts? Would it be both of them, literal and spiritual? Okay, that's one question. How should we see this if we are comparing this using Miller's rules? I mean, if, if Habakkuk chapter 2 is a faint description of reality, if we look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, we would see the following. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Were we not reproved? after the situation with July 18th. Yes, we will. Now, in the book of Habakkuk, it continues. So join with me. Turn to the book of Habakkuk. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. Because if this is a faint description of the reality then we need to be looking so that we can see a clear description of reality. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. A doubling. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Since 1843, have we not understood that this table, this chart, that we are to understand that this has been made upon these tables, and that we are to be prepared to run when we read them. Habakkuk 2, 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Have these not been part of the appointed time since they were first presented? Yes, because uh, they also uh, show us of the turning time. And also, yes, and also this message we find that Ellen White, uh, within the, in her writing, the first vision, she talks about the midnight, the, the right, which is the midnight cry. So it simply means uh, these are the messages that uh, she even said that uh, those who rejected them fell to the wicked uh, okay. world below. Yeah. So here we are today I would have to dare say that we have come to midnight are we prepared yet for the midnight cry for the vision is yet for an appointed time but at the end it shall speak and not lie Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, 
but the just shall live by his faith. If the just shall live by his faith, does he not become righteous because of faith in Christ? Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Are we to be proud and are we to be transgressing by wine? Are we to be accepting of false doctrine? No, no we're not. not. So. Now, as this book continues, the next title that is here is Woe to the Chaldeans. Shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which not that is not his. How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee? And thou shalt be for booties unto them. Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, and all that dwell therein. Are we to become laden with clay? Are we to accept that we are to become laden with thick clay? For in the book of Revelation, where do we find clay being referenced? We have miry clay, dirty clay. Dirty clay. Impurities in it. A lot of impurities in it. And what happens when that miry clay is then fired, is put into the fire. It doesn't hold together. It it uh, it splinters. You it know, falls it falls apart, right? Oh, it falls apart. Yeah, you just get little pieces. Are we not seeking today for the whole truth? Are we not seeking today for the gold, which is God's word? Are we not looking for this to be converting the soul? Do we wish to be the metal that is purified, such as silver and gold, where the refiner can see his visage, his face, in the refined metal? Can the refiner see his reflection in the clay? If the refiner cannot see his reflection in the clay, then what value is it when it falls apart? Zechariah 4.1 And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep.
in the parable of the ten virgins. We're just part of them asleep or we're all asleep. All, all asleep. Everyone. Zechariah is talking to all of us today. For this angel has come and has spoken with Zechariah as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Here, Zechariah 2, verse 3, And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. But here is Daniel. Daniel 8, 18. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. So even the prophet Daniel was in a deep sleep. Zechariah was as one that was wakened out of his sleep. Had Daniel been given visions before he fell in this deep sleep? Are we today being awakened as to what our duty is? What say you? I agree. Okay. Zechariah 4.2. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Now, the alternate readings would render it this way. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with her bowl upon the top of it. Not a, but her. And his seven lamps thereon, and seven several pipes to the lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Here is this candlestick with her bowl. The candlestick being the church and her bowl being on the top of it. With the gender denominative being used, we can identify this even more clearly, that this is a reference that points to a church of this world. A church that is true to God. A church that is willing to follow God wherever he so directs. And the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by army, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Using the alternate reading. We need to consider carefully these verses that we have just read, we need to be prepared to give an answer 
for these verses and for the symbols that are being addressed. We need to come to an understanding of what God would have us to know at this time. This is relevant for us today. It is not just relevant for 520 BC. Now, do we have any questions with what we've covered so far? Do we have any questions about the verses or about what has been being presented from the spirit of prophecy? Do you have any thoughts? Okay. This becomes the point at which we will conclude this Sabbath study. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, there is much for us to consider from your prophets. We ask, Father, that you will help us to consider these items to prepare us for the work that you would have us to do, that you will show us that which we need to understand at this time. Bless us now, guide and direct us in all things, so that what is done may be done to glorify your name and glorify your character. Please forgive us of our sins, of our doubts, direct us in the path where you would have us to walk. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.